Okay. I think we got it figured out. Um, lights. Uh, lights. Yeah, just lower it. I will. I will talk much louder. Is that good for everybody? Okay. All right. So we got dual screen. I think that's okay. All right. Physiology. What is physiology? Physiology, whether you're talking about human or comparative, when you're looking at other animals, is about homeostasis, right? Your body spends an inordinate amount of energy, more than 60% of what's called your basal metabolic rate comes from just being alive, okay? So homeostasis is a framework for human physiology. I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, cells are the fundamental units of life, exchange nutrients and waste with their surroundings, right? Then there's the intracellular fluid is conditioned by the interstitial fluid, which is conditioned by the plasma, um, and then by the organ systems that it passes through. Don't worry about that, it's not that important. So when I do stuff like that, it's not that I'm trying to trick you, it's probably not that important. When I spend time on it, you'll know what's important. Okay. So this is an important statement. Okay, so this is important. Um, and I'll read it to you. It says, homeostasis refers to the dynamic mechanisms. Dynamic. What do we mean by dynamic? So somebody define that for me in their own words and how it can be used here. Why are we saying that? Yeah, Mike. It's in flux. It's always changing. Right? You're constantly changing. Every time I move, my body has to adapt to that. My system has to adapt to it. And then when I stop, it has to adapt again. Right? So homeostasis refers to the dynamic mechanisms that detect, detect. So what do we have to have to detect? What's doing the detecting? Receptors, what else? Anything else? Neurons, okay, but they have neurons, right? So your, your systems that communicate Neurological system, your neurological system, right? They're detecting things. And respond to deviations in physiological variables from their set point. So think about set point. What are we talking about? Why are we talking about a set point? Are we talking about a thermostat? No. Kind of. What are we talking about? Crystal. Say that again. Well, it's not steady. But, but you're sort of on it. Whenever. Yeah, there's a point, a normal condition steady. So you're sort of around the term. Your body has specific points for normality that it would like to be set at. So let's take, for instance, blood pH, super important, roughly about 7.35. Now, does it always is it always 7.35? That's where it likes to be. That is the sweet spot where you function best at most conditions, right? So there are set points for rest, and then there are set points for things like exercise, right? And they're different because you have different needs during different conditions. Set points during sleep, not the same, okay? Deviations and physiological variables from their set point values by initiating effector responses that restore the variables to the optimal physiological range. There's an optimal range for everything to function at. Okay? And if you are outside of those optimal ranges for too long, and your body doesn't bring you back, bad things start to occur. Okay? So one of the differences between you at your age and me as I get up in age is that your body, because you're young, is built with what I call what's called tolerances. Extremely high tolerance. So what do I mean by that? I just use this example in my experimental design class. When they build an aircraft, okay, when they build an aircraft, 
they build that aircraft to withstand five to seven times the forces it will ever encounter in the air. When they build your car, right, they build that car to pass a certain test at a certain angle, at a certain speed. The car is not built with the same tolerance as that airplane. That the airplane is designed to withstand crazy things that might happen while you're in the air. Your car, although safe, right, is not quite built to that capacity. So if you don't crash that car, that Toyota Camry, at a specific angle, at a specific speed, a certain way, it will fail the test. If you crash the airplane in a different way or expose it to different forces, it will be fine. You guys are like the airplane. I'm like the camera. You guys can get like you guys can get away with so much garbage as far as what you can do to yourself, and your body just resets it. But as you age, the tolerance goes away. All of a sudden, you wake up. I don't understand why I wake up. I just hear this every morning. You know, it's a little disturbing when there's a part of you that you can't see that's making a noise that you don't understand. And it was there 20 years ago, right? So that's what ends up happening. You start to lose that ability to come back to physiological range. And so the older you get, the more and more difficult it becomes for that to happen. Questions on Okay. So this is cells, right? These are the different levels of organization within physiology. I, I like to say, you know, physiology is basically all of the sciences from genes to cell and the lack, all the way up and beyond, right? All of this is considered to me physiology. I don't differentiate. All right. This, don't worry about this. I'm not going to test you. If you've never taken an anatomy phys course before, I think that this chart will kind of catch you up to speed. These are all of the anatomical systems, okay? And it gives you a little bit about each one of them. Am I going to test you on this? I don't want to insult your intelligence in this course, no. But if you haven't taken a course like this before, you may want to familiarize yourself with some of the basics of some of these systems. So when I refer to the urinary system, which I also like to refer to as the renal system, you're like, you know what I'm talking about. We're talking the same language. If I talk about the integumentary system, you're like, what's the integumentary system? Well, it tells you what the integumentary system is. Basically the skin. But not that simple. Okay? So I promise that I won't pull something from this table and say, define the following systems. I won't do that. Okay? It's just too easy. There's no challenge with it. All right. This is where, it, um, this is really important. Okay? These two figures um, are important because we're talking about fluid. You're mostly fluid. We're going to talk about how fluid moves throughout your body and how you can adjust and readjust it and why it's important. But first of all, you need to know the following. There are three main compartments. So there's actually two major and then one of the majors is subdivided. So the way I would break this down is into the Extracellular fluid, which is abbreviated ECF, okay, and then the intracellular fluid, which is abbreviated ICF. Then the extracellular fluid is subdivided into the interstitial and the plasma. It just doesn't say extracellular here. Okay. I know it might be hard to see from that form, and I apologize. All right, so let's talk about them. So 
most of 67% of the water in your body, okay, 67% of the water in your body is located in your cells. That's the largest of the fluid compartments, right? Then the other, in this case, 32%, 33%, give or take. And you can see, we'll, we'll use slightly different numbers, depending. Um, it is located in the extracellular compartment. 26% of that is interstitial, which is all the stuff in between the cells. And 7% of that is actually your blood, or what's in your blood. So that's the percentage breakdown. Those, those are important percentages to know. Okay? You can then convert that into liters. These are important to know. So 28 liters of water, that equates to 67%, is inside your cells. That the 67% and 28 liters are equivalent. Okay? Of the 14 liters that's outside of your cells, 11 is between the cells, and about 3 liters, give or take, in your blood. Now, are these values the same for everybody in this room? Why or why not? Give me the rationale. Yeah, calm. The size of a person. Right? So um, if you're a larger person, your overall volumes are going to be higher. I mean, you can have males. There may be some males in this class that have plasma volumes closer to six liters. There may be some males in this class who are closer to three. So that manipulates all of the rest of these numbers. You carry more water if you're larger. It's as simple as that. But we're going to use these basic numbers and percentages. Assume that in physiology, the standard person used to be, and I think still is, is a 160, 65 pound man. And so a lot of these numbers are based on that. I don't know why they picked that. This is something that they picked. Questions? Tell me if I'm not speaking loud enough. So, these are the, this is the intracellular fluid, the interstitial plasma, and of course you've got the organs. This is your internal environment, so this is all internal, and then obviously you have your external environment, everything that's outside of your body. So this is an important concept. Exchange and communication are key concepts for understanding physiological homeostasis. So this class, physiology, is designed to give you an understanding of how things are in a normal, healthy person. Now, I use examples of sleep. I use examples of exercise. I use examples of pathophys, right? But you have to understand first what normal is. Okay? All right, let's look at some other stuff. Um, Blood glucose levels increase after eating. Levels return to their set point via homeostasis. You can see this graph as glucose is on the y-axis in milligrams per deciliter. This is time of day. You have the three major meals of the day that most people in the U.S. still eat. Not everybody, but most. Okay? And you'll notice that with each meal, the spike gets bigger. Why is the spike getting bigger? What's that? Bigger portions. Yeah, there's more sugar, more protein. The more sugar, the more protein, the higher your blood glucose spikes. So the meal's bigger. So that basically says that most people eat most of their calories at night. Is that true for everybody? No. Okay. This is an example of a dynamic constancy. Levels change over short periods of time. But notice what happens. After each meal, what does the system do to the blood glucose level? Sets it back. Right? Try. In a normal system, it always comes back to the same level. Does that make sense? Now, it may overshoot and come back, but it will come back. The idea is not even overshoot it if you can, but that's what happens a lot. Um, get used to schematics like this. As a physiologist, I will tell you that I am partial to schematics like this on how things work. 
when you're describing things. These up and down arrows, I do this a lot. Okay, where well, I'll say room temperature, the arrow down meaning the room temperature decrease. The arrow up here says that there's an increase in heat loss. It's just an abbreviation so that I don't have to write increase, decrease, increase, decrease. Okay, so you can see what happens and how this starts getting very, very complicated. Right? If you have a decrease in room temperature, you're increasing heat loss from the body and your body temperature then increases. So this is external. Everybody agree? It's external. Then what happens is you have the body's responses. You can constrict the skin blood vessel. You don't have to write this down because this is getting into systems. I just want this is an example of the types of things you're going to see. This is an introductory lecture. All right? Constriction of the skin and blood vessels, you can curl off, you can shiver. There's a response. What are you trying to do? You're trying to get back to 98.6 or whatever your set point is. Everybody's is slightly different. The body sees that as a threat. Okay? So well, how do you do that? You do all of these things. This, these prevent heat loss. This is going to increase heat production. Eventually you return. Are we okay with that? This is an enzyme. So if this is a cell molecule class, it's just not. It's physiology, sort of the same idea. You have a substrate, you have inactive intermediate one, inactive intermediate two, active product, and then there's a negative sign with a dotted arrow going back. That's what's called a negative feedback loop. That's a very important point. The body is designed with a lot of these feedback loops, just like the thermostat in your house. Right? You set your thermostat in your house to 70 degrees, the temperature drops a couple of degrees to 68 maybe, it probably doesn't go that low. Cars are more regulated than that, let's just use that as an example. When it gets to that trigger point, the threshold, the furnace kicks on. The furnace kicks on until you get slightly over 70 degrees, the furnace kicks off. That's a negative feedback loop. This is a natural one that's in your body. That's a mechanical, electrical one that is out inside of your body, right? It's not, it's a machine. So the active product controls a sequence of chemical reactions by inhibiting the sequence rate limiting enzyme. Again, this is, these are just examples. We're gonna go through systems. A lot of introductory concepts. The strategy for exploring homeostasis you identify the internal environmental variable, example concentration of glucose in the blood, you establish the set point, it's somewhere between 70 and 110 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood, and you identify the inputs and the outputs, diet and energy. So this is just like experimental design in some ways, right? This is how you understand, you have to identify an internal environmental variable blood pressure, heart rate, cholesterol, breathing rate, temperature. You have to know what its set point is. So in this class, is there a lot of memorizing? Sure. There has to be, right? You have to memorize all of the norms. So when I ask you a question about what happens if, then you can answer the question. So in that respect, it's very similar to an anatomical system and there's a lot of stuff to memorize. But here I want you to apply it at a much higher level of thinking. Okay? So strategy for exploring, examine the balance between the inputs and the outputs, determine how the body monitors, senses the variables, and identify effectors that restore the variable. So these are all the things that have to happen in order for your for you to understand what's going on. Alright. This Again, you can read over it. Um, it's for your knowledge. I won't ask you any of this directly. So you can read this just as well as I can. Right. This is just to make it clear of what homeostasis is. I may ask about it on, on an exam. Define homeostasis for me, and then tell me some of the crucial generalizations about the system. That's the type of question I might ask. Alright. Questions. We'll keep moving on. Uh, this is an important pathway. Again, I'll tell you when I think something's super important. Um, 
an integration center. You have what are called efferent pathways and afferent. If you're a neuro major, you've probably heard this before. Efferent means moving away from the central nervous system. This is moving away from the um, system, the integrator. Afferent is towards. If you move away, you have an effector. In this case, let's use an example. Let's say this is the motor cortex in your brain. You have a, a, an electrical chemical signal that is sent to your muscles. In this case, it's my hand, right? That signal goes from my head to my hand or arm, and I, my response is moving. Now, the negative feedback loop is once I get my hand to where I want it to be, there's a stimulus that goes back to my brain, to the receptors, to the afferent pathways, and ultimately say, okay, I'm where I want to be, stop. So I don't continue to do this, so that I'm not doing one of these. Again, just another example. So these are lots of examples for you, all right? And you can see what happens. So you need to understand systems like this. I want you to understand a basic system. That way, when I ask you a question on the exam, you can use something like this, but just change the parts. Does that make sense to everybody? Like, I don't want you to memorize this. Maybe the construct of this flow chart, which is good, right? The different parts, you have an afferent receptor stimuli, efferent um, effector, and then the negative feedback loop. But do you actually have to go in and memorize this particular one? It's a waste of your time. Okay. Communications, there's three categories basic, um, when we're talking about um, the endocrine system. There's endocrine signaling. That is where signals reach often distant target transport to the blood. So endocrine hormones like estrogen gets dumped into the blood and travels far, far away from the ovaries in a female. So that's an endocrine response. Paracrine the signal reaches neighboring cells. So what would that look like? Well, if I have a cell here, and I have another cell here, and another cell here, and let's say that this cell produces serotonin, which happens to be a hormone slash neurotransmitter, and that serotonin then gets binds to receptors on these two cells. It's pretty local. That's what's called a paracrine response. So it's not in the blood, so it's not an endocrine hormone, but it's a paracrine hormone. And then you have autocrine. Autocrine, the signal affects the cell. So you produce serotonin. That serotonin feeds back on the exact cell that made it and causes something to happen. That's an autocrine response. I sort of loop these all into the endocrine system, though. Right? They're just different levels of endocrine. But technically, an endocrine hormone has to be in the blood. All right, here's our examples of communication. So you have hormones secreting gland cell, dumps a hormone into a blood, affects a target cell. You have a nerve that produces an electrochemical signal, produces a neurotransmitter, and then the neuron or effector cell. And then you have another nerve that actually causes the production, or excuse me, neuron, not nerve, nerve cell. Another neuron that produces a hormone that reaches a target. So there's a, an intimate relationship between the nervous system and the endocrine system. Those are the two major components. So if you took anatomy with me last semester, I said, what are the two major communication systems in the body? The endocrine system and the nervous system. Now we're going to get more into how some of that stuff actually occurs. And then you have this paracrine level, right? So this is more in the blood or neurotransmitter. Here you have local or autocrine, where there's a feedback loop on itself. Question. Oh, 
Yeah, so Max's question is, if you have an impulse from a neuron via axon to another neuron, could that be considered paracrine? I suppose, at some level, it is a paracrine response. The only difference, though, is that it could be connected to much broader. But it is essentially paracrine, because it is cell to cell, right? So it's a different level of paracrine. So they, here's some examples of steroids that are made. Again, I'm not going to make a big deal about it. Okay, other examples. So here you have temperature, uh, growth hormone, cortisol, um, which is a steroid hormone. It's called a glucocorticoid, and urinary potassium. So this looks at, as social physiology, what makes me different than a cellular or a molecular biologist? someone who calls himself that. A lot of these names are really arbitrary, by the way. They really are. But we have them, so we got to live with them. So what makes me different is, at the end of the day, I may study a potassium channel. Okay? I may study cortisol. So let's say I'm an endocrinologist who's interested in stress. And I study the hormone cortisol. And at the level that a, a molecular biologist or a cellular biologist is interested in is they just want to know what happens in the cell. That's all they care about, generally speaking, okay, if we're using the exact definitions. As a physiologist, I want to know what happens up the chain and down the chain. I want to know what happens in the genetics, in the DNA, at the molecular level, and I also want to know what happens to the whole body, the entire organism. I have to, for me, to make sense of things, I have to understand how it affects everything. So I'm constantly thinking, how do we make this bigger, and how do we make it smaller, and go back and forth. That's, I think, the major difference if you ask a physiologist. I'm a classically trained physiologist. That's the major difference. The techniques, all that, there's really no difference in it. You can't even tell who's a molecular biologist, a neurophysiologist. We're all intertwining. But for me, at least in my head, I need to be able to put it back into the big picture and how everything affects everything else. It's complicated. So you can see what happens. Um, you have the temperature rises from 36 to 37 degrees centigrade. What happens here is you get a small spike in growth hormone, okay, and plasma cortisol starts to come down. So this is over a 24-hour period, okay? So imagine, imagine that this is, um, I don't know, 7 a.m. in the morning, okay? 7 a.m. in the morning. What happens to urinary potassium? It goes up. As you move throughout the day, what ends up happening is your core temperature drops and at the same time your core temperature drops, you get a surge in growth hormone. That actually occurs. About two hours after you go to sleep, assuming you haven't eaten anything, you get a surge in growth hormone. That is true. Okay? What else happens? Throughout the evening, your cortisol levels drop. Now, something stressful happened here that caused cortisol levels to go up again. All right, so something happened here. But typically, they continue to drop until you wake up and then you get a spike. And then you can see what happens to urinary potassium. The idea is that in this class, I want you to connect all the pieces. That's how you have to start thinking about physiology. How do I connect every piece? Now, am I going to do it right off the bat? No, that's what your final exam is. You've got to connect all the pieces. So you've got an entire semester to get there. But I want you to start thinking, like Max is asking the question, how is something else related to this? Always think, okay, well, how is this other system involved? Don't just reserve yourself to the topic I'm specifically on for that day. Try to start connecting pieces. All right. uh, this is a net gain and a net loss, um, a, sort of a schematic. Again, I'm not going to test you on this. But you know, there's food, there's air, there's synthesis, right? There's a distribution within the body, and then you lose stuff from the body. You excrete carbon dioxide, feces, 
urine, menstrual flow, metabolism, you use energy. Yeah, Leonard. That's exactly the So the pool, the pool is essentially all of the food, all of the air, okay, that comes in your body, you can think about it. So this is a, this is a theoretical mental construct of a pool. Is there an actual pool where all of the food goes and the air goes? No. So it's a theoretical concept. You can think about it, that it, there is a pool. In other words, it comes in, but it gets really distributed very, very quickly. But in your mind, if you think about all of this going to a pool and then getting redistributed, it sort of makes it easier to understand. Right? Everything goes to a main warehouse. Let's use Walmart as an example. Okay, how the hell does Walmart have anything to do with physiology? <laughs> You'll see. Okay, Walmart, right, one of the biggest corporations on the planet, the way they function is they have huge distribution centers, right? So whatever they order ends up going to one of these massive distribution centers, and there are many of them across the country. There may be multiple ones per state. They centralize everything. So the Christmas toys come in, the farm stuff comes in, the clothes come in, they all go to a central distribution center. And then from there they have semis, right, that take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and everything else, and they send it to individual stores. You can sort of think about the food that you eat and the air that you bring in as all going to one central store, and then the body, in essence, the mind, however you want to think about it, decides where it goes. It's not magic. Your body works the same way. Now, is this theoretical pool actually exist? The Walmart distribution center does. Right. That's true. That's real. But this pool doesn't actually exist. But I think it, it is an effort for the authors of this book to try to simplify the concept so that you can sort of wrap your mind around it. Because I think if you don't, you're like, well, it goes in your intestines, and right away I can see what students are doing. It's going into your intestines, and it's going through all this stuff, and it's just getting distributed. It's really hard to wrap your mind around it, but if you think about it as to going to one central pool, then you can say, okay, now I get it. It goes to a pool, and then we pick off the Walmart example, right? The distribution center, take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, whatever you need. And every store, gets a slightly different variation of all the stuff. Because maybe one store that's in the heartland of the country gets a lot more tools and farming type of equipment. So that those semis are going more with that, maybe less with clothes. Maybe if you're on the East Coast, obviously I'm just making this stuff up, it's not true, right? On the East Coast, they don't farm. Like, I grew up, I was born in Brooklyn, right? We didn't have goats in Brooklyn. <laughs> There's no goats, right? There's no farm equipment in the middle of Brooklyn. In Manhattan, would you crazy? Forget about it, right? You don't, you don't see stuff like that. But clothes? Yeah, sure, lots of clothes. Clothes for everything in the movie. So that's sort of how your body works, too. It distributes things according to the specific need of the system. And that changes on a minute by minute basis. Okay. You can go through all that. This one's interesting. Um, sodium. So anybody that's been to Nicaragua, it's a good example of what happens. Um, here's what happens. So here's sodium ingested and blue and sodium excreted. So assume that this is normal. And this is grams per day. Now, seven grams per day, I hope I surely hope that you don't ingest seven grams of sodium a day. But I think what the authors did is they probably got this from data. I bet you that the average American consumes a lot. Okay. The recommended amount is 2,300 milligrams, which is 2.3 grams per day. So this is probably not that far off, okay? Because everything you eat has salt in it. All right. So let's assume you're at roughly seven, five, or six grams per day, and all of a sudden you start eating more. You decide you're going to eat more pizzas. Okay? I went to graduate school with a guy who ate pizzas every day for a week. 
just to do it. Maybe you're one of these people. Well, his sodium intake just went up a ton, right? He also ate peaches every day for a week. Canned peaches. That didn't end up well. Yeah. Yeah. The carrots. He's nuts. He's nuts. Okay. So your ex your input goes up, but what happens to your excretion on day two? So the first day, the first day actually, this is the day it happens. Does the excretion match the ingestion? No, but it has it gone up. So is your body trying to correct this? Okay, then you go to the first day following. Do they match yet? They don't. It takes the rest of this day, this full day, and part of the third day or second day, depending on how you want to count that, for your body to come back. So when you eat a lot of salt, when you're not used to eating a lot of salt, this means that for a couple of days you feel like what? Bloated. Because it takes that long for your body to get the homeostasis back. It's not instantaneous. The bigger the perturbation, the perturbation is an insult to the body. The bigger the insult to your body, the longer it's going to take for it to get back to homeostasis. And that's an example. And then once you do, you're pretty much excreting as much as you take in. So are you bloated anymore? No. But that doesn't mean that you're in a good place. If you're eating 15 grams of salt a day, heaven help you. That's terrible. In so many different ways. Why can you get away with it? Because you're like an airplane. And I'm like a Toyota camera. <laughs> Remember that. That's the difference. You're the airplane, I'm the camera. When I start doing this, you won't see me for a week. It'd be terrible. Yes, sir. So it's just working the opposite direction. Correct. That's correct. So what Sarah's question is, is would this work in the opposite direction? Yeah. So this is what bodybuilders do. So I, in case anybody that hasn't had me before, I'm I'm sort of the fitness guru to do a lot of different. I'm really interested in physiology and human performance, so I use a lot of examples. Bodybuilders figured this out years ago, decades ago, on how to manipulate water. So they call it salt loading. This is essentially what you're doing here. You load up with salt, but you drink a lot of water. So along with this, what they did is when they're trying to lean out, if you ever see some of those pictures and you can see like their skin and it looks like it's really, really thin, that's because the water content under the skin is gone, but very temporarily. So what they do is they start eating a ton of salt. A few days before, a week or two weeks before, they start drinking up to three gallons of water. Three gallons of water. Talk about having to go to the bathroom, okay, a day. Then. What Sarah's mentioning, and I call this dropping the bottom out, about a day before competition, you stop eating the salt and you keep drinking the water. The day of, you don't drink any water. What's going to happen to the body? All of that water is going to shrink and go away, and that's how you look super ripped. It is very temporary. So Hugh Jackman and Wolverine, the, the most recent one that he did, right? That look that he's got is all due to water manipulation. That's the trick they play. It is super dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing, you can die. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Okay? Good question. All right. All right. So that's that's the end of that one. Yeah. Four. Oh, it's related, yeah, it's related to Nicaragua because you can use this to your advantage to hold on to water. So what you can do is a couple of days or at least the day before, so when I go on the trip, the, about a day and a half before you go up Madeiras, you know, because when it's super hot, I say you're going to start loading with salt. Just eat a ton of it and you're going to start drinking some water because you're going to get bloated and you're going to hold on to extra salt, which means you're going to hold on to extra water so that you're less likely to get dehydrated. If you do it too soon, the body adapts, and so you don't ever want to do that. So 
when I go, this is one of the tricks I tell people. So you can start, that's why I tell people to eat a lot of salt when we go on that trip. We went, the first nurse practitioner we went on the trip with was mortified. When, before we left for Nicaragua, I told every student, you're gonna eat as much salt as you can get your hands on. You're gonna put salt on everything. You're gonna put salt on top of salt. And she was mortified. She's like, you're gonna kill him. I'm like, her name was Luann. I'm like, Luann, I'm not gonna kill him. You think the salt is the problem in Nicaragua? It's not the salt, it's the rum. That's the problem. <laughs> it's not the salt. I promise you, I'm not gonna kill him. So it's, it's, this is part of the physiology, right? This is how your body adapts. It takes some time, you use that to your advantage. So we're gonna to go to the next lecture. Any questions? So this one's basic. The things that I highlighted that I said are important, that's the stuff that you need to keep and you need to start understanding and memorizing so you can use that. All right, well, let me go to the next section. Yeah, they did. I mean, Morgan Spurs got a current show that's on, um, I don't know if it's on A&E or Sci-Fi. Oh, okay. Yeah, he, he was back in normal. Yeah, McDonald's killed All right, so this is the first meeting chapter. This is the first one that has some stuff in it may, may or may not be familiar with where there's more information, where that was sort of an overview check, okay? There is stuff in the book, in the reading, that is important that I don't cover in the lecture. For instance, negative feedback, positive feedback, feed forward control, things like that that will show up on exam. You really need to do the reading. If you have questions about it, obviously, let me know. But, so, don't get lulled to you. There is stuff in that chapter that is important. Okay. So this one's about movement of molecules across the cell. Membranes equals transmembrane traffic. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about diffusion. All right. In the next class, I'm going to ask you to take out a couple of the handouts, the one with the intracellular and extracellular concentrations, um, osmolarity. So you're going to get the osmolarity homework if I get to where I want to. We're going to start talking about that kind of stuff. There's also one on penetrating substances. So there are three handouts we're going to deal with next class. We won't do it today. Okay, diffusion. So most of you, I hope, know, know this concept. Diffusion moves down what I like to say is the electrochemical gradient. And the reason I say electrochemical is because just saying concentration gradient may be too simplistic for physiology. Now, there may be no electrical component, but that's, you always have to think about it as an electrochemical gradient. Because oftentimes there is an electrical component to something moving, you just are not aware of it. So I'd like for you to use that terminology in my class, if you would, and think about the electrochemical gradient. Simple diffusion. Again, real basic concepts. Don't get lulled by this. Small. So oxygen. Gases can penetrate anything. Right? They move freely everywhere. And they move from high concentration to low concentration. Why does carbon dioxide move from my lungs into the air? There are two reasons. The first one is obvious. What's the first one? Carbon dioxide, CO2, moves from my lungs into the air. For two reasons. The first one's pretty obvious. That's the least obvious. So, so Teresa said from concentration gradient. That's, that's the least obvious. The, the most obvious is that the, the lungs recoil, and that recoil pushes them out. But it's also because the concentration of carbon dioxide inside your lungs 
is much higher than in the atmosphere. Okay? So that helps. Facilitated diffusion requires some kind of a transporter, like glucose. Glucose uses something called glute transporters. It uses something called glute transporters. And I will write that for you. They're called glute transporters. And they're one through seven. They're not all functional. One is, one's for basal stuff. Number four is the one that's activated by insulin and exercise. And then there's a bunch of other ones that, that exist, but they don't do anything. They are transport systems. Glucose is a large polar hydrophilic molecule. It cannot penetrate the cell membrane on its own. Gases can. Right? So it's is facilitated diffusion in this case when you eat sugar and it gets into your blood, goes from your blood into the interstitium to get to the cell. Is that still using diffusion with this transport? What do you think and why? I don't care if you're wrong, just think. That's all I care about. Think. Yes, Teresa says yes. Anybody agree with Teresa? Max says yes. Yes, that's how it, the transporter in this case gets inserted into the membrane. And because the amount of sugar, in this case glucose, that's outside the cell is higher than that inside the cell, the electrochemical gradient sends it in. What happens if the amount of sugar inside the cell becomes higher than that outside the cell. What would happen to the sugar inside the cell? It would, but we know that from biochemistry, and a bunch of you probably have already taken biochemistry, that a series of chemical reactions occur that change glucose very, very quickly, right? And so that it can't escape again. But if it could, if it stayed in its form, it would just go in and out until it came to equilibrium. And that would be bad. So it doesn't happen. Okay. Active transport. Now we're going to go through some of this. I'm going to do some stuff on the board too. But active transport, solutes move against the concentration gradient. Sound like some will like a little bit? Yeah. Welcome. Okay. So, and there's two kinds. There's actually more than two kinds, but we'll just deal with two in this class. Right. The first one is called primary active transport. Primary active transport uses ATP. ATP is the energy molecule. You don't run on glucose. You run on ATP. Does glucose, here's for the biochem students, does glucose get turned into ATP? Good. Glucose gets used to make ATP but it does not get turned into ATP, okay? ATP directly is consumed, ex the example is the sodium potassium ATP is. And I'm gonna draw a picture for you of all of these. Then there's something called secondary active transport. That's where you use an electrochemical gradient that has been generated by one of these pumps. And I'll often refer to them as pumps, okay? All right, let me draw a little bit of this for you. All right, this is the way I like to draw my cells. Okay, this is the ECF, get used to it, the extracellular fluid. Okay, this is the ICF, so this is inside the cell, this is outside the cell. All right, so if you're talking about something like oxygen, right, it's going to go right through that cell. All right. If you're talking about something like glucose, and I like to draw my transporters, a transporter and a carrier are essentially the same thing. I use them interchangeably. 
carrier or transport means the same thing. So if I say either one of those on the exam, they're the same thing. Let's just assume that this is a GLUT4 glucose transporter, right? Let's say that this is a blood vessel, a capillary in this case, right? This is a capillary. And it's, we're going to make G glucose. It's going to go into the interstitium. If there's a transporter available and the electrochemical gradient is favorable, then this thing is going to get swung in here and going to end up in the cell. This and this both use simple diffusion. Or ex excuse me, diffusion. This is simple diffusion. This is facilitated diffusion. It uses a transporter or a carrier. Because this molecule doesn't need help, this molecule does. All right? Everybody with me so far? Can you repeat that again? Sure. Which molecule? So, O2, oxygen, uses simple diffusion because it can penetrate the semi-permeable phospholipid bilayer with no problems. So this is simple. It doesn't need anybody's help. This is called facilitated simple diffusion because it, they both work on the electrochemical gradient, but this one goes down and needs the carrier. Without the carrier, glucose will not get in or out of the cell. It has to have a carrier because the molecule is such that it's polar, large, and hydrophilic. Okay. Then you have the types of active transport. All right. So I'm going to draw, again, I like to keep things simple. You're going to know when I do this that this is an active transport because you'll always see this. That shows that ATP is being burned because, right, you dump a phosphate off the end, you cleave that bond, and now you form ADP and an inorganic phosphate. So that means that you're using energy. The primary example that is used is the write this in a second here. This is the sodium potassium ATPase. It is a, an example of active transport. Now, that sheet that we're going to use or bring out next time is important because the fact that three sodiums get kicked out and two potassium get kicked in doesn't mean anything to you right now unless you remember why that should mean something. The bottom line is that outside the cell has a higher electrochemical gradient, a higher concentration of sodium than inside the cell. <laughs> inside the cell has a higher, high, uh, excuse me, a higher concentration of potassium. In order to go against the gradient, this is the equivalent of pushing the ball up the hill. You need energy, right? If I put a ball at the bottom of a hill, assuming there's no wind, you're in a perfect vacuum, okay? Is that ball gonna magically roll up the hill? No, it has to be acted on by an, an outside force. So you can look at the ATP as that outside force that makes this thing churn. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Because if you're not, stop me. It's okay. Yeah, Alexa. This is primary active transport. This is primary. So this is a primary active transport. Very good. Excellent question. That's important. Yeah, Matt. This is the one with the glucose. That's a transporter or a carrier, right? A transporter or a carrier, and that is considered facilitated diffusion. Correct. Those are good questions. It bet I can fix in a short period of time what would take you hours to figure out on your own. Use me. Not in that way. Okay. Anyway, so this is primary active transport. Okay. There are examples of what are called secondary active transport. And I'm going to use this example. Again, I, I make them all look the same, but they're not. In this case, all right, in this case, we're going to have two 
two to three. We don't know if that. Now, what's important about that? This is called, so this is secondary active transporter. Okay? Now, what do you notice about this? Based on stuff, so you have to start being perceptive when I say something, okay? Just don't take me at my word on stuff, okay? I, we just talked about primary active transport. I, I, I picked this one for a reason. Yeah, Colin. So we're not hydrolyzing ATP, but it, yet it's considered active. So there has to be a reason why they give it that secondary active transport. Okay, so what's the engine, Teresa? Yeah. This pump, these sodium potassium ATPases set up this huge gradient. It's gigantic compared to the inside. That then gets used as energy to drive this part of this transporter. So if sodium is going down its electrical chemical gradients, and this, this is the sodium potassium exchanger. An exchanger is also a transporter. That's another name. Sorry, there's just lots of names for them. Sodium, the sodium calcium exchanger, if this is going down its electrochemical gradient, and I'm telling you that the, for a fact that this is secondary active transport, then what does this mean about calcium? What has to be true in order to make this secondary? Somebody else other than Teresa. Then we'll give Teresa a shot. Yeah. No ATP was hydrolyzed. Well, no ATP was hy hydrolyzed, but beyond that, Sarah. Yes, calcium has to be going against the gradient. So if you knew nothing else before this class, now you know that if one of these is in there, that the calcium inside the cell must be higher. I mean, the calcium outside the cell must be higher than the calcium inside the cell. Because if that wasn't true, would it need a secondary active transport mechanism to get rid of it? Okay, why is it called active transport? It uses energy. Where did the active part of it end up? Where did it start? That's right. This ATP essentially powers this, which ultimately indirectly powers this. I'm going to talk to you about a drug when we get to cardio that ends up poisoning this. And it actually gets used for um, heart failure patients. We're going to use that same mechanism when we get there. Okay? All right. I think that's enough for today. Okay. So with tradition, I didn't give you a break today only because I'm trying to catch up a little bit because we didn't lecture on the first day. Okay. Traditionally, what I do in my class is the following. If you had to, to your friend who's not here, okay, he's a really good friend, a good student, they asked you, if, but they're not very bright. Okay? Three or four major points, big picture stuff, and because they're not very bright, they don't have a long-term memory, they have problems, right? Lots of drugs, whatever, but they, they, they mean well, okay? So you can only give them three or four major points because they're just not going to remember more than that. What would some of those points be? Crystal. Homeostasis. And what, what about homeostasis? Go deeper than that. Yeah and that there's a bunch of tables that go into more depth. So homeostasis, that's one of them. What else? The electrochemical gradient. Yep, that's an important one. What else? Diffusion. Diffusion. Diffusion is part of that. It's a big one. OK, even. The three, that's huge. The three major compartments. There are actually two major compartments, and one is subcategorized and has two. So it ends up being three. I would say, Teresa, you have another one? Yeah, the endocrine system is a communication system and the interaction between that and the central nervous system. Those are big points that then this person who has got a bad memory and sad can go into the book and say, okay, I gotta look at the reading in this way because these are important. Okay? Any other questions? I hope I spoke loud enough. This is kind of cool, right? Two screens. I don't even know what to do with myself.
turn around. I may go to the back so you don't see me. Then how cool would that be? Yeah, question. Um, for the book stuff, prior to chapter four, do you want us to like go through all three? Um, no. The question is, for the book stuff prior to chapter four, do I want you to go through chapters two and three? You can skip them. They are, um, yeah, you don't have to do them. to Kendra and I guess I'm assigned to um, Dr. Polino from chemistry again. But I might sign up for two credits of research again if that's all right. I got two more credits to put, I could put in 18. You know, so. I mean, I'm never going to say no. Right. So, yeah, I'd love to have it. So if you want to do that, 